Okay, we're going to get started this evening. I was just trying to see how long she could play without me being here. We're going to begin with a hymn uh, titled His Robes for Mine. And I just want to admit, I can't lead this hymn without saying something about it. Um, at our afternoon service, we've been going, the, going through the life of David in 1 Samuel. And uh, very interesting parallels between David's life and that of the Lord Jesus. In fact, when you get to 2 Samuel, it mentions that he was uh, like the forerunner of a greater kingdom, which would be the kingdom of Jesus Christ. But when um, David came in contact with Saul, who was the king at that time, it says in chapter 18 of 1 Samuel, and it came to pass when he had made an end of speaking unto Saul, that the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And Saul took him that day and would let, would let him go no more home to his father's house. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was upon him and gave it to David, and his garments, even to his sword, and to his bow, and to his girdle. So if you can picture for just a moment the kind of an introduction to this song, His Ropes for Mine, uh, about Jonathan taking his kingly garments, because he was the son of the king, and his father was looking forward to David when he would be the king rather than David, taking his kingly garments stripping himself of them and giving them to David, which is interesting because David was just a shepherd. He was a nobody in the eyes of most people in Israel at that time. But a man who was going to be the next king gave his garments to David for him to wear. And I just wanted to do that as a uh, kind of introduction to this hymn, which says, his robes for mine, a wonderful exchange. The robes of the Lord Jesus have been given to us. We are like kings and priests, as scripture says, and we have been given these robes of the Lord Jesus, and he took our garments, put him on himself, and he died in our place. So as we think about this song and we sing it this evening, let's re be reminded of the great sacrifice that was made on our behalf by the Lord Jesus when he took our place and gave us his. Let's stand as we sing. 279. Well, it's on the overhead. His room's for mine, no wonder it's changed. Though in my sin, I suffered in God's rage. Drink in his righteousness, I justify. In Christ I live. I cling to 
is hurt for mine, such anguish none can know. Thank you for that singing. I trust that that was an encouragement to you. Those words speak to my heart, and I trust they do to you too. Let's open with prayer, shall we? Father, we are so thankful that we have this opportunity to gather here tonight. We are overwhelmed when we stop to think about the price that was paid for our redemption. We are thankful that your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, was willing to offer himself to take our place, our punishment, all that we deserve, so that we might be redeemed by his precious blood. We thank you for this gift. It is beyond our comprehension. We cannot even begin to fathom the depth of such love. We thank you for this uh, evening and an opportunity to once again gather as your people to come and uh, hear from your word and to voice our prayers and to pray about needs in our church fellowship. And certainly there are many needs that are on our hearts tonight. And we pray that this time might be well spent and we would recognize the great privilege that we have to come before the mercy seat and make these requests known unto you. We ask that your spirit would minister to us tonight and that we would go away refreshed and uh, filled, and we would be able to accomplish your purposes through our life in the remainder of this week. We just pray for Brother Brosnan as he comes and ministers to us and speaks. We pray that you would use him to challenge us afresh in your word. Give us ears to hear and hearts that are content with the message. Bless our time here. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, before Brother Brosnan comes, I'm going to ask Steve to come. I'm not able always to hear all of the requests out in the congregation, so I asked him if he would come and he'll take the requests and pray for us this evening. All right. I have uh, two newer prayer requests that we got from the church office a little bit ago. Um, if you remember Lynn Dosher, he will be having surgery this Friday morning to break up a large kidney stone. Um, I believe that's something he, he had a battle before. Um, so remember that this Friday. And also Judy Dosher is, has a torn meniscus and will have a brace uh, put on for several weeks. If you can remember those. And then looking at your prayer request uh, bulletin, um, remember Pastor and Amber, they will be returning, I believe, tomorrow uh, from their trip to Italy. That's uh, quite a long flight. Um, if you've followed them on Facebook or social media, it looks like they've had an enjoyable time and an encouraging time uh, with the Tacons and others over in Italy. Uh, Diane Brantley uh, broke her arm last week when she fell. Uh, we continue to remember that in prayer. And... Um, also, Walter, while he was there waiting, uh, got exposed to a uh, virus or something that's affecting his breathing. So if you can remember to pray for him. And uh, continue to remember Beverly Hobbs. Um, I saw David here. Is there an update on how she's doing? Or does anybody know? Oh, yes, hiding. Okay. All right. So continue to remember her and uh, fighting over this pneumonia. 
Uh, Ed Sample uh, is having a procedure this Friday to have his heart shocked. Remember that him in prayer. And uh, continue to remember Rhapsody Schmidt's mom. Um, she's now under hospice care. Uh, Steve Anderson, um, it's good to see him. I think it was his last Sunday sitting back there. Continue to remember him in prayer as he recovers and uh, continues his treatment. Um, I believe this is the Baptist Church Planning Mission, uh, BCPM. It's planning three new churches, uh, California, Texas, and someone needs to help me out with this, Halifax. Nova Scotia, okay, I was gonna say it's not a state, so uh, Nova Scotia as well. Uh, continue to pray for the McKinney's. Uh, Jacob and Shara got their, uh, their visas. The boys still need to get their visas, and I don't believe they can get those till April 15th, it says, but they're leaving, planning to leave late May, so it's getting it kind of tight. Uh, remember to keep that in prayer. Um, uh, remember the Lees, as they are looking to establish their ministry in the Solomon Islands. The Taylors are in language school in Chile. And then uh, pray for the furlough replacements, uh, the Seacrests and the Wrights, the Seacrests in Scotland and the Wrights in South Korea. And then also be in prayer for those that they're replacing uh, temporarily. Uh, as they, I'm sure they'll be traveling back to the States or wherever they're going to, to have their furlough. Um, are there any other prayer requests at this time? Yes, sir. Okay. 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 So there's travel to Chile to help out with the uh, tailors. And then also Nathan Childs is having his last treatment um, t tomorrow or this week. Okay, uh, remember that. And then doctors to have wisdom on how to uh, pursue further treatment if necessary. Yes, Roger. That was Roger Crowder uh, thanking everybody for their prayers, continued prayers. Um, and then uh, as he walks and uh, they won't fall and remain steady. Uh, so you continue to uh, remember to continue to uplift him in prayer. Anybody else? Yes. Okay. Remember Sterling's recovery from surgery. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so there's a, a group of students who, who did well on their, um, was it singing? Or hand bells. Hand bells. And, okay. And uh, so they're traveling to uh, the national competition. Remember those, uh, the students to do well, and then for the staff that went with them to be safe on the road. Anything else? We can be thankful the storms didn't hit up here like they thought they were gonna. Uh, but just showed me a video. It looks like Mobile got quite a lot of rain, a lot of flooding and stuff down south. So uh, remember, Stephanie. Continue to remember Stephanie Marsh. Anything else? Yes, Roger.
Okay. Uh, Roger was asking for continued prayer uh, a month ago uh, when uh, Sharon left. Um, but he's thankful for the hope that we have in, in Christ to be able to see her again and to see Christ and all the lost loved ones as well. All right, anything else? All right, let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that you are our God. Father, that you do love us, that you care for us. Father, we thank you for your word that encourages us of these promises, Lord, that you are a loving God, that you are um, a God who, who sacrificed, was willing to sacrifice his only begotten son on our behalf, Father, so that we could spend eternity with you in heaven. Father, I thank you for our, our church. I thank you for the members that came out today on a, a rainy day, uh, middle of the week. Father, I'm sure there are all sorts of excuses that we could come up with to justify not coming today. Uh, but Father, I thank you that they did. Uh, I know some are here that are hurting, uh, that are sick, uh, perhaps are, are struggling with other uh, issues, Father. I just, I'm encouraged that they're here, and I thank you that um, we just have a building that, that's open, that's, that's paid for. I thank you that um, we have a, a godly pastor and uh, supporting staff, Lord, so that when our pastor can't be here, that there are other men that can step up into the pulpit and that can preach your word. Father, I pray that we wouldn't take that for granted. Father, we would truly be thankful for, for what you've done here in our church, and I pray that we continue to uplift it in prayer, that we wouldn't be content just to sit on the sidelines or to be sitting in the pews and, and just be hearers, but Father, that we would uh, be doers of the word, that we would uh, be active in our church, that we would look for ways to help, and um, whether it be helping other members who, who need help, Lord, or... Um, offering to teach in a Sunday school class or, or sing in a choir, whatever it may be. I pray that you would help us to be able to participate for the purpose of worshiping you and glorifying you. Father, I think of uh, the prayer requests, Lord, on the bulletin today. Some are new, some have been on there for a while. Um, but I think of Pastor and Amber as they are returning tomorrow from their trip to Italy. Uh, I pray that it will have been an encouraging time, uh, perhaps a restful time. And uh, thank you that they were able to to talk with Joey and Jenny and, and other missionaries in the area. And I pray that um, you just help there to be uh, long-lasting fruit from just that, that short amount and that short trip. And um, Father, again, that you give them safety on the road and in the air. I think of Diane Brantley as she broke her arm uh, last week. I pray that you would continue to strengthen, heal it, strengthen it. Um, pray that it won't be a hindrance uh, too much with her day-to-day -day operations. And uh, now she has to take care of Walter Pray that you would strengthen his lungs and his body, Lord, to get over this respiratory illness. And uh, I also think of Beverly Hobbs' father. I thank you that they were able to, the doctors were able to diagnose um, what was uh, uh, presumably the, the issue with her. Uh, I pray that she'd um, get some good rest at the hospital and that she'd be able to get uh, fully cured from, from pneumonia and uh, just strengthen her body. I pray that you'd be with David, Lord, as he, he visits her and uh, does his uh, other day-to-day -day activities that you would just give him safety on the road and, and strength as well. I think of Ed Sample, um, as he will be having this procedure on, a, uh, on Friday, actually, uh, to shock his heart back into rhythm, Father, as it's uh, a scary thought. Um, I'm sure it's one that's um, kept him restless. I pray that he would get rest, though, before the, the operation, that he would be uh, encouraged and find a peace that only you can give. And uh, Father, just that that treatment will uh, not only be effective, but um, they will have a speedy recovery as well. Father, thank you, Ramsey Schmidt's mom, as we've been praying for her for a while. I pray that as she's been di uh, discontinued her chemo, that the drugs will, will wear off and that the pain medication will uh, be more effective. And uh, Father, I pray that you'd be with her, uh, especially be with the family during this time, though, and as they make preparations. Um, I pray that you would just comfort them and... Uh, that they would feel your love and your peace as well and be encouraged by those around them as well. Father, I think of Steve Anderson. I thank you for the testimony that he was able to stand up here and give uh, just a few weeks ago. And uh, Father, I pray that you would continue to do mighty things in their lives, uh, that he would continue to be a testimony, even though it might not be what he or anybody would have uh, chosen for him, Father. It's not something that caught you by guard, uh, off guard. Father, I pray that 
you would help him to find peace in that, and uh, Lord, just that you'd uh, use him and his wife uh, into the future. I pray that it would also be an example to us as well, Lord. None of us knows how long we have uh, to live for sure, but also with uh, just the things we take for granted, our ability to move and talk freely. Uh, I pray that we'd make the most of, of our opportunities that we have. I think of uh, Baptist Church planning missions, Lord, as they're planning three new churches this year, um, the next few months, actually. Um, I pray that you would continue to strengthen them, that they'd be able to uh, reach the communities, uh, if they go door to door or wall hangers or door hangers, whatever they, they do. I pray that they'd have great opening Sundays and uh, that you'd be able to see churches crop up and uh, be able to start new churches in, in addition. And uh, Father, I pray that you just help us realize how great the need is and that we will continue to pray for these, these opportunities. Think of the McKinney's, Lord. I thank you and praise you that uh, Jacob and Cheryl received their visa. And I uh, pray that you just help the, the boys to be able to get their visas now too as they've already made plans to travel in May. And uh, Father, I know there's a lot more preparation that takes place than just visas. And I pray that you would be with them in all those situa- or all those uh, steps. Uh, think also of the Lees as they're getting established in Solomon Islands. I pray that you would help that to, to go smoothly, help as they uh, interact potentially with other missionaries or um, just getting to know the people. And uh, Father, I pray that you would establish that, that ministry and help it to be fruitful. I think also of the Taylors in, uh, in Chile, Lord, um, as they are at language school. I pray that you would uh, give them strength and wisdom, Lord, as I know it can be difficult to learn a new language. It can be tiresome. Um, I pray that you would just help them to, to work hard and uh, see the fruit of all that effort. Father, I think also of uh, the furlough replacements, uh, the Seacrests in Scotland and the Wrights in South Korea, Lord, that you would give them safety, uh, that you would help make the preparation as they're usually there for, for multiple weeks. I pray that the churches would continue to grow in the absence of the, the missionaries and uh, that the missionaries would get uh, a, a decent amount of rest on their furlough, Lord, but they'd also be able to be rejuvenated and encouraged as they, they visit their sending churches. And... Uh, Father, I pray that you just give them safety and, and provide for any transportation needs they might have. Father, I think of um, Nathan Childs as he's receiving his last treatment uh, or his last pill this week. I pray that you would give the doctors wisdom on, on what's next, Lord, that uh, he'd be able to get a clean scan, um, perhaps, and, and uh, be able to go uh, uh, about his business, continue life without taking any more medication. Father, I pray that you would... Um, just to encourage him and his family and uh, the church and the, the various uh, folks around him, Lord, on the ministry and on the mission field. Um, Father, I also think of uh, Sterling as he's recovering from surgery. I pray that you continue to help that uh, to go smoothly, that he'd have a, a quick recovery and be able to get back to being uh, active again. Father, I think of uh, the students uh, that are traveling this week. Uh, I'm going to... I believe Bob Jones, Lord, for the national uh, competition. I pray that you would help them to do well, that they would um, ultimately have a desire in their hearts, Lord, not just for for attention or for for fame, Lord, but that they would have a true desire to worship you and that it would show in their faces and in their expressions as they play and sing. And uh, Father, it would just be a testimony to everybody that hears it. And I pray also for uh, Stephanie Marsh um, with her recent... uh, Scans. I pray that you would uh, continue to give her peace, uh, help her with this uh, muscular pain that she's been having. Uh, I pray, pray that she'll be able to get some rest and uh, that you give uh, her and Andy wisdom into the future, Lord, as to what you would have for them. And uh, also think of Roger. I thank you for the praise that he was able to give. Um, the thanks he, he shares for his church body, praying for him and encouraging him and uplifting him. Um, and just the, the comfort he's able to get from your word, uh, knowing that one day we will all be in your presence, Lord. And it seems sometimes that that day can't be soon enough. But Father, I pray that we would uh, make the best of our opportunities in time, as I mentioned earlier, that we would uh, eagerly wait for you, but even while we wait, that we would be uh, witnessing, that we would be edifying one another, that we'd be shed, uh, spreading the, the light of the gospel to those who are in need. Father, I pray now for <clears throat> tonight that you would just help us to have open hearts and open minds, that we would hear your word, that we would be like the fertile soil that's ready um, to have the seed planted, and that we would let it grow. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you, Steve. We're going to sing another hymn before Brother Brosnan comes. I just am so thankful that he is uh, preaching to us tonight. I have always been challenged greatly by his messages. He's been through some difficult times and some deep waters, but it has only been used by the Lord to deepen his message in preaching and teaching. We're going to sing the hymn number 286, Hallelujah, What a Savior. If you'd like to stand together as we sing, we'll sing that just before the message. Well, good evening, and uh, I'm happy to uh, fill in this evening for Pastor. I, I think that probably everyone here recognizes what a valuable service it is that he and his wife can minister uh, to the missionaries, and uh, I'm thankful that he's willing to take the time to take a trip like that, and uh, I'm sure that uh, it's been well worth it, and uh, so it opens the door for me once again to be in the pulpit, which I'm thankful for the opportunity. And uh, tonight, uh, I'll give you a couple clues as to what the subject is going to be. And uh, it is a single word we're going to look at tonight, a subject. Um, and uh, it is a word that is found in our Pledge of Allegiance. So if you think about the Pledge of Allegiance, you'll come across this word. Um, and the reason I am actually uh, was thinking about this was because uh, my wife and I recently had been going through the book of Esther. And as we went through that book, this particular theme kept popping up over and over again. And so it was, it was on my mind, and I was uh, thinking about it. And, uh, and then as, as you begin to think about it, I'll give you another clue you can actually think of this word as an attribute of God or certainly a part of his character. And, uh, and then uh, I'll give you one last clue, and I'm sure you probably all got it by now, but it's something that we expect but increasing, increasingly uh, lack in our current judicial system. So you probably have nailed it by now. Uh, yes, I am going to just touch on the subject tonight of justice. Justice. I, 
I'm quite sure that in my entire ministry, i would never once given a sermon to the subject of justice. And um, I'd like to do that tonight, although this is not technically a sermon and it won't be long. Um, I do think that it is of increasing importance. I think it's more and more on the minds of Christian people Today, perhaps more so than in the past. And uh, so there's really two questions that pop up, uh, in my mind at least, as, as I want to launch out into this subject with you. One would be, how should a Christian understand the concept of justice? That's almost... Uh, driving toward an idea of a def definition of justice. And then secondly, how should a Christian respond to injustice in society, but also experientially as an individual person? How do I respond biblically as a Christian to the injustice that I may encounter in my own life? And that's the practical side of the discussion. Of course, if you think about it, even for a very short time, you'll realize you can't talk about justice without talking about injustice. The one kind of defines the other. And so that's what we're looking at tonight. I remember very well, the, maybe the first time in my young life, when I really had a very strong sense of injustice uh, being perpetrated against me. And I remember the lingering, festering sore it left in my soul for quite some time. Uh, I did finally get over it, but I was in high school, and um, I was uh, privileged to go to a Christian school, and uh, our cross-country team really, really wanted to have uh, matching uh, workout uh, sweatsuit outfits. And the school could not provide that for us. And so we decided that we were going to do a fundraiser. And everyone on the cross-country team went out and got people to make pledges. I will pay X amount of money for every mile that you run. Now, of course, this run was to be done at one time, at one stretch of time, but in one evening. But it was, a, it was a pledge to pay by the mile. And most of us are accustomed to getting paid by the hour. But in this case, we were getting paid by the mile. So we were really earning our money. And uh, I remember I got all my pledges together and I figured out how many miles I'd have to run to make a certain amount of money. And on that particular evening, uh, I remember all of us on the cross-country team, we got out of school about an hour or two early that day, which was a real perk. Um, and, uh, and we went off and we ran, and we raised a lot of money. Um, I ran from Indianapolis to Greenfield, and I know that Brother Pat knows where that is because he's very familiar with that area. But, uh, you know, I really put an effort in, and we raised a lot of money. We raised enough money. And so we put all of our money together, and it was deposited there uh, in the treasury of the Christian school. And lo and behold, before we could get around to buying our sweatsuits for our cross-country team, the school embarked on a much-needed uh, renovation, which put them in tremendous financial straits. And the headmaster of the school made a declaration that all funds under the control of the school were to be used for this one single purpose, and that was to pay for these renovations. And I couldn't believe it when I heard that they stole our money. We never got the money. We never got our sweatsuits. All of our sweat and effort went toward building the Christian school, which I guess is a good thing. I still to this day feel like I was treated unjustly, and pray for me if you think I have a root of bitterness. i got to get over that. But uh, anyway, we all know the feeling, don't we? And that's what we're looking at tonight, justice versus injustice. 
And I think that we give more thought to the subject of justice than we used to because we're experiencing in our day the pain and the consequences of injustice in our society. Unabated, widespread injustice in society breeds anger. It breeds anarchy. Injustice destabilizes the fabric of society. Just, uh, I think it was less than two weeks ago, uh, Bill O'Reilly made a statement, and I'm, I'm going to quote him. Uh, he was commenting on the murder of a police officer. You may remember Detective uh, Jonathan Diller. And here's the statement that Bill O'Reilly made. You cannot have a just society without confronting injustice. Well, that's a very simple but profound statement. And perhaps there is no simpler definition of injustice than what we find in Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 20. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's so simply stated, I think it's, it's, it's uh, powerful. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, and that put darkness for light and light for darkness. I do feel that that more and more does describe the state and the direction and the trend of our society, our country, if you put it in those terms, our judicial system, our societal behavior and norms and morality. So justice is really a huge topic. You've probably already been surprised by the direction I've taken because the moment I mentioned the topic justice, you can think of four or five or six major directions you could go with that. And all of them would be very worthy topics or, or developments for that topic. Uh, we could go in any of those directions. Uh, we could focus on justice as a reflection of the nature of God. And that would be a fundamental foundational approach to the subject of justice. We could deal tonight with justice as it relates to God's law. By the law, we know what is right and what is wrong, and we are judged by that law. And justice is the application of that law to lawbreakers. Uh, we could discuss justice as it relates to our personal culpability for sin and the judgment that we deserve because of that. We could spend the whole evening on that. That gets back to that beautiful hymn that we sang at the opening of the service tonight. Really, I think it's become one of my favorites. I love that hymn. His robes for mine. Where would we be if it weren't for, for that uh, work of Christ that satisfies the just arm of a righteous God? Uh, we could deal with the subject in a more practical way. Uh, talk about how it impacts uh, our lives as Christians, how we respond, uh, how we influence. Um, and uh, that really is more the direction that I want to go with the few minutes that we have here tonight uh, and the, the way that it affects society. So many today are asking, just as Abraham did, way back in the book of Genesis, Genesis 18, in fact. And Genesis made uh, this state, actually it was a question. It was not a rhetorical question. It was a legitimate question. He was speaking to the Lord himself, and he says in verse 25, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? If you look at the context there, 
in Abraham's heart and mind, he felt that God was proposing to do something unjust. God was proposing an action that would violate Abraham's sense of what is equitable, what is right, what is fair. And he's saying, Lord, are you really going to judge the righteous with the wicked? Are you going to take the innocent people and have them suffer the same judgment as the wicked people? Shall not the judge of all the earth, shall not you do right here, implying that you are proposing to do wrong? Now, maybe you interpret that a little different than I, but I can't help but believe that Abraham legitimately was questioning the Lord, and almost as if he viewed him on a human level, like, do you not realize that what you're proposing is unjust? Before we get too hard on Abraham, I would dare say we've probably all done the same thing with something that we've experienced in our own lives that seemed just outside of the nature and character of God. Surely God was sleeping in this moment. God must not care for me like he cares for other people. There's something going on here because this is not what God would have allowed. This violates my concept of who God is. Therefore, God's not behind this. A just God would not allow this. So, when you look at Abraham here and how he negotiated with God over the fate of Sodom, uh, we get a real insight into the uh, challenge that we have in comprehending our great God. And in our limited capacity, we are unable sometimes to reconcile what our theology says about the nature of God and our high view of God and all of his glorious attributes, and yet the realities of what God does and allows and uh, the events that take place on this fallen globe of ours. So, uh, I would say this before we move on from Abraham if you are tempted to question God, I would advise you to do it the way Abraham did. Rather than complain about God to other people, uh, just take your complaint directly to him and uh, deal with it directly with him. I think God takes that a little better, and uh, that's probably the advisable way to go when we're not understanding what God's doing in our lives. Now, from a more uh, academic perspective, I should just briefly mention that uh, justice is often viewed as either uh, the idea of equality of distribution uh, relative to a transaction. Both parties got uh, an equitable exchange in a transaction. Uh, it's also the idea of equality of rewards or punishment, equal treatment under the law is how we say it. Um, in other words, it, it's not that if you're of one political party, you get away with murder. If you're another political party, you go to jail for not including your middle initial on a legal document. So uh, equal treatment under the law. Right? That's what we're looking for, justice. So that's often what it's referring to uh, in a more academic uh, setting. Uh, and it's symbolized, as I'm sure you know, by this lady justice. And she's holding a scale, right? And she has a blindfold, many times a blindfold, symbolic of um, the equity the, the blindness to bias, just treating everyone equally. And that's the idea of justice in the judicial system. And that really dates back all the way to 
Roman, even pre-Roman times. In fact, there was a Roman goddess by the name of um, Just, Justitia. And uh, you can, of course, see where the word justice comes from there. All right, then, uh, theologically, and again, I don't want to deal, we could spend a whole series uh, looking at this theologically. Uh, I would just say that theologically, justice is a scary subject. Yeah, I mean, it puts fear in my bones when I look at justice from a theological point of view. Because suddenly, I find myself standing in front of a holy, just God who, and I'm inexcusable, and I'm guilty, and I'm just waiting for that bolt of lightning uh, and that, uh, that dropping of the gavel on me as a condemned person because of my sinfulness. And uh, so from a theological point of view, it's not a real attractive subject uh, until we get to the grace part of it. Uh, but you know, it made me think, we like to demand justice in the way others treat us, especially government and the legal system. But we don't so much want ourselves to have to be dealt in a just way. I don't want God to give me what I deserve. I don't want that. You don't want that. I'm thankful for grace. Um, let me quote Ryrie in his basic theology. Uh, he explains why God's mercy does not violate his justice. Uh, and I'm just going to give a quote and move on because of time. But Ryrie says this, Only the substitutionary death of Christ can provide that which God's justice demands and thereby become the basis for the gift of eternal life to those who believe. And uh, we also have this statement in the Evangelical Dictionary of Biblical Theology, which I believe is identifying the root of objective justice, which really gets at what I'm talking about tonight, more of a practical societal aspect. Uh, listen to this quote. Justice is rooted in the very nature of God. Just one short, simple statement. But the moment we accept that statement as true, justice becomes objective. It's not the whim of someone wearing a robe. It is an objective truth based in law. And so, or in this case, in a person from whom law emanates and represents his character. Uh, so, <clears throat> if God is just, and we are made in his image, then the application of laws which govern human society ought to reflect that moral foundation of blind equality, which is justice, equal treatment under the law. Um, now, as we look at the Old and New Testament, justice really has a very different emphasis. And I'll just very briefly say that as a theme, justice is much more prevalent in the Old Testament, but it also has a different focus. And the Old Testament prophets especially emphasized Jehovah as a just God. And the distinction uh, is the Old Testament connection of justice with law. And in the New Testament, it's the connection of justice with mercy. So you have justice as coming from law in the Old Testament. You have justice being satisfied by the a propitiation, propitiatory work of Christ in the New Testament. And you have then, if you look at just two words, to contrast the Old Testament justice and New Testament justice, I think what you're looking at it as, as condemnation and justification. And who can tell me what is perhaps the premier New Testament verse that is going to contrast uh, 
condemnation and justification. There's more than one, but there's one that just pops out at me. And I'm sure some of you are, have it in your minds. Romans 8.1. Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Now, when a believer, when a Christian suffers through no fault of his own and as a direct consequence of injustice, it absolutely can shake his faith. It can shake, more specifically, his confidence in a just God. And it can leave a believer asking questions. Maybe different questions, but like Abraham, shall not the God of all the earth do right? Uh, it could be any number of things that leaves the head spinning. Uh, and again, I'm saying in all of these, if it's an unjust action, uh, getting fired from a job, for example, uh, loss of property, imprisonment, maybe a frivolous lawsuit, uh, in our modern day, ransomware, uh, identity theft, violent harm. Imagine for a moment, and I hope this isn't true of anyone here, because it's a very sensitive thing to bring up, but imagine if a loved one is killed by a drunk driver, and after the fact, you find out that that person actually had numerous DUIs and was never held accountable, and now you have a loved one whose life has been snuffed out. So these are the types of things that can really play havoc in the faith of a believer when you try to reconcile it with your view of God and specifically your view of God's justice. And especially when the perpetrators of injustice suffer no retribution and they only seem to prosper from their deeds. It can really injure our sense of God's justice because the scriptures and especially books like Proverbs uh, they repeatedly contrast God's just dealings with the righteous and the unrighteous. And over and over again in the book of Proverbs, do right and this will happen. Do wrong and this will happen. Beware. It's often talking about the principle of sowing and reaping in this life, not just all things made right in eternity. And yet, in a specific instance, in a particular circumstances, a st circumstance, in the will of God for your life or mine, we may experience something that doesn't fit the law of sowing and reaping. We may sow all the good and reap bad. And we may look at others who, who live a life of crime and benefit from it tremendously at our expense. And you could find many examples in Scripture of that, couldn't you? But we expect that a man's going to reap what he sows in this life. So when the norm runs contrary to our expectation, it really can shake our confidence in God. We ask questions like, does God play favorites? Uh, does he really care? Um, how can a truly just God allow this? Um, and... Honestly, it may very well be. I, I think it's probably true that there are numbers of folks here this evening and, and listening online, and that's not a problem for you. You can honestly say, you know, I'm not struggling with that. Well, thank God. Thank God if that's the, the measure of your, of your faith and strength today. But be aware, be aware that there are others who are struggling with that that you need to be aware of. It may be able to reach out to and help. And your day may be coming as well when these types of temptations will come your way. So Peter told us to expect mistreatment. And uh, whether you look in 1 Peter 4.12 or you look in John 15.20, both of those passages, and I intended to go there, but for sake of time, I want to keep this moving you look in those passages, and Peter says, don't be surprised 
if you suffer. <laughs> and the passage in John it says, hey, do you expect to be treated better than your Savior? If they despise the Lord, if he was treated unjustly, if the criminal was let go and he was crucified, do you expect better treatment when you identify with his name? So, we see that it's important, and this is one of my purposes tonight, and one of the ways I want to couch this whole discussion, it's important as a believer that I don't expect to be treated fairly in this life. I need to understand that it is normal for a believer to be mistreated by a fallen, ungodly, God-hating society. We have lived in a cocoon for 200 and some years. And the cocoon is starting to shred, and the fabric of that cocoon is, is rotting and falling apart. And we as believers might start living a more normal Christian experience going forward. And part of that has to do with this subject of justice. You know, we look in the Bible, and even Joseph, even though it was a long time coming, he finally did see justice in his lifetime. Uh, even as Tamara and I read through the book of Esther, you know, uh, Haman finally saw his, uh, his luck run out, and uh, he got the uh, judgment that he was trying to unjustly put on Mordecai. Um, David did eventually reign as king. He didn't run forever from Saul. And so, we need to realize, though, that even despite those, and those are some examples of long-delayed justice, there are many times in this life that injustices are never righted. And we need to accept that that is the case. So, I want to be balanced as I close this up this evening and say that even Paul, the Apostle Paul, sought justice under Roman law. When able to, he used the law to his advantage, and he exercised his rights under the law uh, to appeal to Caesar and to be treated fairly. So, absolutely and certainly, to the degree that we can, we should seek justice, uh, we should expose injustice in our society. I'm not saying that we shouldn't care, and you're always going to feel it, but we shouldn't be fatalistic about injustice. You know, Christianity is not a fatalistic faith like Islam. Uh, we're not going to take that approach. We do care. We do want to have an influence. We want to believe that we can make a difference. But combating injustice has been, throughout all of human history, largely a losing battle. And it is not the Christian's expectation to win that war. Now, the reality is that God's justice is not restrained by our sense of fairness and equality. The truth is we do not deserve his mercy. We are naive to expect justice from our society or government. And perhaps nowhere in Scripture is the proper attitude more succinctly stated than in 1 Peter chapter 2, I'm going to quote it for you here, uh, verses 20 and 21. For what glory is it if when ye be buffeted for our faults, ye take it patiently? But if when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow in his steps. 
I really struggled with how to conclude this. Lots of times in a sermon, you want to just bring it all together and put a bow on top at the end. That's not going to happen with this subject. Um, and uh, I don't know how you would finish this message, but I'm real happy with how I'm going to finish it. And that is, first of all, I'm going to share with you a verse. Of, you can't go wrong by saying what Scripture says. So I'm going to share with you from Isaiah 42. You might want to turn there. And I'm going to break from what I normally would do. I would normally always prefer to read from the King James Version, but because the NIV in these verses has translated the Hebrew word justice, uh, I'm going to actually read from the NIV uh, on these verses. Isaiah 42, verses 1 to 4, and I'm going to read it slow enough so that you can just Take in all of what we've said tonight into what we're reading here, okay? And let me also preface this by saying, I hope you're familiar with the suffering servant of Isaiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth. In his law the islands will put their hope. And then I'm just going to share a quote from the Dictionary of Biblical Imagery because it is stated so well. This description of justice and the one who will administer justice is compelling. The reader is drawn to the strength and mercy of the servant and longs to see the day of his coming. Justice here is personal, filled with mercy and love and deliverance. It is associated with what is right and good and holy, integrity and truthfulness and faithfulness are implicit in the passage. Revealing the nature of God's justice. All right, let's uh, do close in a word of prayer and we'll be dismissed this evening. Our just God, we look to you tonight thanking you for who you are, the very nature from which we derive our laws, our morality, our guide for conduct, our love for one another, and the functioning of our various societies and human governments. We thank you, Lord, for your leadership in this area, for your uh, perfect, your, for your perfection. And Lord, we ask that as we go forth tonight that we would revel in the reality that we don't face justice for what we deserve, but that we can try to reflect God in practicing justice among ourselves. For we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. You are dismissed.